Keith Tier is the US managing partner of Accelerated Digital Ventures, and he puts out a weekly newsletter, Venture Trends, in which he puts his prescient finger on the future of the venture capital industry. Uh, this now.tv show is going weekly, and we're going to talk to Keith on a, on, a, on a Thursday about trends in the venture business. Keith, it's May 15th, 2020. I'm guessing that the pandemic is dominating the thinking of VCs all over the world. Well, you know, there's nothing like a venture capitalist for reinventing the future based on what's happening in the present. Um, the present doesn't stay the same for very long in Silicon Valley. So it isn't a surprise that this week in the newsletter, almost everything in the newsletter is asking questions about what will change how permanent the changes will be, both for companies and for investors. Um, uh, you know, will work become distributed? Will, will San Francisco remain relevant if work becomes distributed, given how expensive it is? So there's a lot in the newsletter about that. Um, there's also a lot about whether investing will continue to be face-to-face -face and largely done by let's say, let's call it, you know, people who believe themselves to be experts at picking startups, or whether it will be more of a data-driven, more like fintech process investing. So there's a lot in the newsletter this weekend. Everything is about how impermanent the past is and how different the future is going to be. Yeah, and of course, the best venture capitalists are the ones who bet most uh, intelligently on the future. I have to say, though, that this conversation about whether or not Silicon Valley is going to remain the center of the American tech industry is an endless discussion, extremely narcissistic. Uh, what's changed then during the pandemic? Why has the pandemic accelerated um, the importance or perhaps the, the problems of San Francisco and venture and, and Silicon Valley in terms of venture capital? Well, I, I think the first thing to say is it's not clear that that has happened, but it is clear that lots of people are writing about whether it's happened. And, and you know, I would say that um, in, in the newsletter, you've got Fred Wilson, for example, from Union Square Ventures, who is a, a, a wonderful thinker, uh, who writes a piece called Location and Work, and talks about both San Francisco and New York being incredibly expensive but up until now, it wasn't really possible to choose not to be there. And that what the panic uh, around coronavirus has created through enforced remoteness is some practices that um, are sustainable and may even be better in some cases than going to a, an office. And he asked the question, if that's true, you know, will other cities start to, uh, to see a... Um, uh, uh, the rise of the entrepreneur working for companies in the Valley of New York, but not actually living there themselves. That so are venture capitalists now during the pandemic, are they putting millions of dollars into companies without even meeting the startup entrepreneurs? Uh, yep, that's definitely happening. Sequoia Capital announced this week that it's made 10 investments uh, without meeting the founders face to face. Um, I suspect knowing Sequoia's practices, that that is somewhat true, but not 100% true, because they tend to make investments after having known startups for quite a period of time and validating that the team um, successfully does what they say they're going to do. Uh, but I do believe that the final stage was done without face-to-face -face meetings. Um, so I think that is happening. And NFX, which is a newer fund run by a group of people, but including Pete Flint, who was the Trulia founder, and James Courier, has um, put a website up, if you go to the companybrief.com, where you can apply for funding between a million and two million dollars. Uh, it's entirely a virtual process, and they have committed to make feedback within three days and a decision within nine days, and plan on deploying 20 million dollars through that process. So things, that, things like that are definitely happening. I'm curious, are there some VCs who are skeptical of that? After all, the, my understanding at least of the essence of the venture capital industry is you're investing in people rather than ideas. 
are venture capitalists comfortable investing in Zoom people or virtual people? You know, it's interesting. At, at my fund, ADV, we have spent the last three years taking the approach of building a software platform using signals, data signals, to partner with other funds and to invest in their companies. Um, based on agreements we put in place with those other funds, where we actually don't have the right to say no to an investment if the company meets our criteria. So we might actually never meet the company and it's all based on relationships with their, their lead investor who does have a track record and is a person or a group of people and um, the progress of the company according to various criteria. That, that uh, is very close to some of what NFX is doing. Josh Constein uh, left TechCrunch last week to join Signal Fire. It's, yeah, I saw that. Um, it's doing something very similar using data to drive decision making. So I do detect pre-coronavirus, there's already a significant trend towards, let's call it venture as a service um, based on data and relationships. Keith, uh, Fred Wilson, of course, is based uh, in New York with his Union Square Ventures. Is this a, a, another New York versus San Francisco argument about um, who's bigger, who's stronger, who's better? Or is the rest of the country involved too? You know, there, there's always that, but I actually think that's a positive thing. Um, Saul Klein in London, has done a, an amazing job over a decade or more promoting London as a place to invest and has successfully pulled an ecosystem around himself that's now a very you know, sophisticated ecosystem with all stages of investors. And I doubt it would have been as good as it is today had Saul not done that and his dad um, as well, Robin. Uh, I think Fred in New York has done a very similar job and you know you look you can't knock somebody for pointing out the merits of the sit of their city the infrastructure that it brings together the talent the money and so on that said and i'm probably biased it's pretty hard to compete with silicon valley as an equal because silicon valley just has such an integrated set of elements that make doing a startup and taking the risk you need to take easier than it is in many other places. And I doubt they're thinking, I don't think anyone thinks they're competing. They're just seeing the world flatten, become more global, and more and more places become viable places to successfully do startups. Yeah, you are biased. I know you live right in the heart of Silicon Valley, in the heart of uh, Palo Alto, which is of course in the heart of Silicon Valley. But your wife, Janae Thier, who, who lives with you, I think might be slightly less biased. She wrote something interesting this week about the rise of the rest, didn't she? Yeah, she, she wrote a report for Crunchbase called um, uh, America's Mighty Middle. Steve, she interviewed Steve Case earlier in the week, who of course has been uh, pursuing investments um, in the middle of America for quite a long time now. And uh, she pulled together all the stats that show there is indeed a rise of the middle. Uh, Texas actually surprisingly topping the list of states where there's a, been, a, been a quite a growth of investment um, over the last several years. And, you know, with the, um, with the new um, opportunity zones that came out of government policy a couple of years ago, there's now massive tax advantages to investing in, in those zones, most of which exist in the inner cities of the other uh, of the other states, Detroit, Detroit, for example, has, has a, a many of those. And that is attracting capital. Uh, I know that Sean Parker, who was one of the early investors in Facebook, has spent a lot of time uh, pursuing some of those opportunities. Has there been much of a conversation amongst VCs about Elon Musk's confrontation with um, local government in the Bay Area about reopening or, or, or perhaps more broadly, uh, where are VCs on this right to work or right to, to back to work movement? I don't think there's a trend there yet. I've seen, I've, I've seen quotes, uh, mainly in Twitter, 
that would describe Elon as um, drunk or on drugs. <laughs> uh, and I've seen others. Is that true? Do you share that? No, no. I think he's, you know, remember, he's South African. He was raised in apartheid. He hates the state, um, probably more than anyone, because he grew up in a state that was oppressive. And he's an entrepreneur, an independent money entrepreneur, and just wants to get stuff done. So it's completely um, rational. Whether it's right is another question. I, you know, I think there's a wonderful debate uh, going on about Sweden versus um, other places. You know, is lockdown or is herd immunity the right way to deal with, with the virus? And, and, you know, the truth is that science is telling us right now that either one of those could work, you just have to be prepared to pay the price. Um, in the case of lockdown, the price is slow death rates. In the case of Sweden, it's faster death rates that come to an end sooner. And uh, you know, most likely, unless there's a vaccine or, a, or therapeutics, the death rates will be roughly similar. So I, I don't think there's a right or a wrong, but there is a fierce debate and it's highly subjective. Perhaps a data-driven debate. Perhaps species can help us quantify how much a, a life is worth. Has the, how, how, sorry, how much a life is worth. Uh, has there been a, a lot of conversation amongst VCs this week about virtual work. Uh, the two, two of the largest uh, tech companies in, in Silicon Valley, Google and Facebook, this week announced that I think they, they, will, they won't, they're, they're not opening the office, perhaps their offices, their local offices till 2021. Um, are VCs, when they think about the future, imagining all work going virtual and is that forcing them to rethink the value of companies and work i think that that is that the answer is yes but it isn't only triggered by coronavirus i think um you know the rise of slack and zoom and uh, and similar distributed workforce technology uh, significantly predates the, the, the virus and the crisis. One of my um, one of my personal portfolio companies is, is around. It's called Around.co. is a is a kind of a next generation Zoom and is seeing significant uh, traction because human race needs to be able to get stuff done when it isn't face to face. I'm seeing lots of people saying they won't travel in airplanes again for a long time, because uh, they now realize there's no need. Martin Varsavsky, who's a well-known um, uh, Argentinian entrepreneur that started a major Wi-Fi network called Fon, uh, lives in Menorca uh, and is therefore resident in Spain, said this week, you know, I don't know when I'll next fly again. So I, so I, I, I do think you're gonna see lots of investment in technology that can enable productivity um, along this new model. I know that Paul Graham put out a, a provocative tweet. He, he tends to be pretty provocative. Not everyone agrees with him, but he's a very prescient uh, venture capitalist, early, early investor. He talked about perhaps a boom in, what, surveillance technology, because now as everybody works from home, we're gonna need to measure their productivity. I'm not sure if he called for surveillance, but he, he did say that um, productivity would be, uh, would be uh, an interesting thing to look at in this remote distributed workforce. Interestingly enough, uh, um, I, I probably can't talk about it, but my wife's work- You can, you're on camera, Keith. You have to talk about it now you mentioned that. My wife's workplace, Crunchbase, <laughs> have been remote for quite a while now. And yeah. I'll just say, I, I've never seen her get so much done. Uh, it, it, it is actually amazing when you, when, when you uh, have the freedom to just focus and there's less interruptions, how much you get done. And I, I think Paul, Paul's implication, and Paul Graham, by the way, is one of the best tweeters. If you don't follow him, you should, because he's always got interesting things to say every day. Usually he's, uh, he talks about his eight-year-old and 11-year-old children and says, something I said to my eight-year-old. And what he's really saying is, I'm talking to you like you're an eight-year-old. 
<laughs> but it's it's great stuff, and um, and he has good insights. I'm curious, uh, not that you need to talk so publicly about your wife Shanae, but you say that she does a lot more at home than she would in the office. Uh, you have three sons all living at home during the pandemic and not all teenagers, but they're all close to being teenagers. How is she getting everything done? Are you doing all the cooking and the cleaning and the housework? <laughs> you know, I made pizza for lunch, homemade pizza for lunch. I made butter chicken, Indian butter chicken for dinner two nights ago. Um, and I, I, between the two of us, uh, not that I'm a, an astrology believer, but I'm a Virgo and Virgos are in, in incredibly tidy people. And it turns out I am one. So I do a lot of domestic work, um, but I don't do any washing or ironing. And she's been picking that up. Uh, we share the homeschooling. We, our youngest is 13, actually. So they are all teenagers now. Um, so we're sharing the homeschooling. Um, and um, it, yeah, we, you know, every evening uh, around seven, we stop uh, after dinner and we, we binge watch uh, Bosch. So, you know, there's worse, there's worse lifestyles. Keith, back to that tweet from Graham. Um, are there a lot of startups now which are attempting to quantify productivity? I know Jeff Bezos uh, pioneered championed one of these i think it was a company from within amazon it, do you see this as a hot area in 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 the startup world i don't see it as a hot investable area um i and, and where i see it it often concerns me um you know one of the areas that it happens quite a bit is in coding where the number of lines of code somebody writes and how often they submit um, are, are very measurable and have been measured in some organizations for quite a long time. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm personally not convinced that um, you can quantify how good a job is that somebody is doing through stats. Um, I, I, you know, I am probably the laziest person in the world. I will do anything to avoid work that I don't consider useful. And, uh, and uh, on the other hand, when I'm really focused on something that I believe in, I, I'll never stop working. And um, I would hate to be measured. Uh, if you measured me, you'd see this stop, go, stop, go pattern. Yeah. Uh, I could you are the, uh, maybe you're the Lionel Messi of the venture capital world. You stroll around the field for 88 minutes, and then in those other two minutes, you score four goals. Uh, you are, you're a very kind man, Andrew Keane. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the, 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 the venture capital industry, Keith, what, what else are you seeing this week uh, beyond the pandemic? Uh, fintech remains incredibly hot, isn't it? Fintech is going to be hot for a long time, mainly because um, if, you, if you look at the world's money supply, um, you know, hard cash is about $5 trillion and um, the rest is made up of fake cash, debt and derivatives and it amounts to about $300 trillion. So the proportion of the world, which is what you could call financial, um, um, uh, you know, fina fa fake finance is, is a way to think about it. Um, the, it, it. It's just huge. And if you can um, topple that mountain, there's a lot of money to be made by shrinking that pile. So I, I don't see FinTech going away anytime soon. This may be a subject for another show because it's a big subject, but I, on my daily podcast, Keen On, uh, I interviewed Don Tapscott this week, who, of course, is the world's leading authority now on, on blockchain. And we talked about how the need for reliable data was going to perhaps make the pandemic the moment when blockchain becomes real, not just in terms of currency, but in terms of the 
essential validity and reliability of data. Do you share that? I, I don't want to get into too much detail, but is there any evidence that blockchain is getting beyond the hype during the pandemic? Uh, I think it's been getting beyond the hype for a while. Um, this week, Andreessen Horowitz released the first two videos from um, a seven-week um, workshop on crypto and blockchain um, run by Chris Dixon, who's, who leads their new, they, they have a, a blockchain fund, which they just uh, raised the second fund for. Um, and, um, you know, those are great videos to watch. TechCrunch is streaming them. I really recommend going to watch them. But blockchain is really just turning the internet into a massive computer. Uh, the blockchain bit. Or the world, not just the internet, but the whole world, right? The whole world becomes a giant computer. And uh, you, can, you can calculate and compute uh, and um, authenticate and, you know, uh, track pretty much anything you want um, in, in ways that would have been just not possible before. And when you add, when you add tokens and cryptocurrency on top of that, it just gets more and more interesting. You know, Bitcoin this week you know, did what's known as its halvening. That is to say, um, you know, everyone knows there's only going to ever be 21 million Bitcoin. Well, every so often, roughly every three years, the rate at which miners can produce Bitcoin halves. So whereas they could produce 12 Bitcoin every block earlier this week, now they can only produce just over six. And uh, as a result of that, Bitcoin's price is looking at right now, it's at $9,800. It's doubled against gold during the pandemic. Uh, why? Because as a store of value, it represents um, a fixed supply it, uh, the supply is slowing down compared to normal currency, which has got a variable supply, which is growing. So as a store of value, which one would you choose? Finally, Keith, we began with location, 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 talking about Silicon Valley and New York versus the rest of the world and indeed the virtual world. Um, are there any really really brave venture capitalists out there who are betting on the physical, betting on analog, getting back into real estate, anyone investing in restaurants or stores, or is that sector, the analog sector, do you think in the long term essentially dead now? You know, if you'd have asked me before the, the pandemic, I, I probably would have pointed you to lots of evidence that real estate is a, is a hot area. I, I personally think liquidity in real estate is going to get really interesting, and it's a, it, you know, blockchain will be part of that. For example, that, you know, just take, I could use you as an example, but I don't know the numbers. In my case, I've got this house in Palo Alto, it's worth quite a bit. My, I have a mortgage, like anybody should, because you get tax breaks from having a mortgage. My mortgage is just over a million dollars. Um, I own, I don't know. I do, yeah. So I own about 70 or 80% of my house I actually own. Um, I pay $6,500 a month for the mortgage. Um, it seems crazy to me that I have to use debt when I could use shared equity. Um, residential real estate is one of the best asset classes over the long run that there is. Anyone who's owned a house over and over again will tell you they've mostly done well by owning um, over, over longer periods of time, 10 years and more. Certainly over 30 years, it's fantastic. Um, now, institutional capital currently can't own residential real estate, so you have the mortgage industry. But what if somebody would give me, you know, the 1.4 million for my mortgage and own 15 or 20 percent of my house? I didn't pay a mortgage anymore, so now I'd be spending six and a half thousand a month on other stuff. Um, so that would be great for the economy, and debt would go away. So it feel, and I'm seeing lots of companies, Point, Patch, uh, Homebrick, and others. Uh, in, in England, we invest in one called Unmortgage um, uh, some time ago that uh, buys houses for millennials 
and then rents them back to them, but allows the millennials to own the house over time through paying rent. There's lots of plays in this area that get rid of debt and replace it with equity sharing. So I, I think real estate can be interesting, but only if you see the twist. It's a, it's a fintech play, not, uh, not a property play. 